Assalamu alaikum dear students and welcome to the 39th session of the KIPS Distance Learning Program Current Affairs Newspaper Roundup Session. I am your host Sharuk Hadar and today we are going to see the performance of the incumbent Pakistan Zarek and Saaf government in office in two years. So as we all know that recently there has been a lot of criticism, criticism of the PTI government on a number of accounts and uh, recently two days ago the PTI cabinet members also presented a defense of the government highlighting all the important achievements and performance indicators that the PTI government has achieved over its short term of two, period, two years. Now it's important to see the context in which uh, the PTI government came into power before we can analyze what uh, you know achievements and what failures has this government met so far. So first of all, in 2018, the August of 2018, the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government was able to form, uh, sorry, party was able to form government in the centre, in the federal, uh, you know, provin uh, parliament, in Punjab parliament and in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa parliament. Uh, their governments in uh, the centre and in Punjab both are weak governments. They had to rely upon coalition partners in order to form coalition governments which are essentially inherently weak governments and they had to woo a couple of electables and other uh, you know, MPAs and MNAs that were contesting on independent seats rather than having affiliation to any party which the PTI government uh, and you know, basically Jangir Tareem Khan uh, wooed those people into the ranks of the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf, after which they were able to form the government. So there are also a lot of other important things that you need to realize about the elections is that uh, it, uh, there is significant evidence that there was a lot of pre-poll rigging before the run-up to the 2018 general elections by establishment by the military who were basically done with the conventional two-party system which were both inefficient in their delivery and uh, wanted to you know, dislodge the military and the establishment from its position of dominant power. Especially the Noon League which was increasingly becoming uh, more aggressive and assertive in its policy and in its government towards the establishment. So the establishment wanted to try something new, an experiment of sorts and had it not been for establishment support, there are good chances that Imran Khan would not have become the Prime Minister of Pakistan. This is a very stark reality that majority of PTI supporters will not agree to, but that is a reality because your very own host actually worked for the election campaign and was part of the inside team and uh, this host knows what happened there in 2018. So anyhow, this pre-poll rigging was important uh, in the context of bringing a third party into power. Now let's look at the election manifesto and the promises that the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government a political party made before coming into power. So they had a very heavy agenda of anti-corruption number one. They had uh, an agenda for long due change and reform in Pakistan. Thirdly they had uh, you know the agenda of empowering the state institutions because according to them it is the institutions which create great uh, nations and powers on earth and if institutions are not uh, empowered if they're not independent and if they do not have the capacity to deliver public services then naturally the entire country suffers from that uh, inaptitude. Fourthly, uh, they talked about across the board accountability during their election campaigns. They even talked about accountability of generals and uh, you know judiciary and the higher uh, judicial forums under the same uh, you know umbrella. And finally they talked about Pakistan's economic independence and uh, escaping the consistent IMF dependency and international debts and loans and making Pakistan economically independent and sovereign. Well, we all know by now that all of these reforms essentially have not been met to the extent that they were promised. Quite naturally, Imran Khan is a traditional uh, populist leader and he used these slogans to basically uh, appeal to his base of electoral uh, politics and in reality perhaps he also understood that the things that he were promises could never be achieved in the short span of one government in a country like Pakistan which is marred by historical uh, structural uh, in, uh, inadequacies, inefficiencies and historic civil military imbalances which simply cannot be you know, restored or uh, a balance cannot be created so easily in the short term. So uh, finally I think it's important to see that one of the main problems with the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government has been um, its reliance upon its allies in government. So 
the fundamental weakness of a minority government is that it shares the government seats with another political party naturally there are very few political parties who have very closely um, you know resembling ideologies and preferences in office which is why having a coalition partner in government is never a good thing it's basically a compromise or uh, you know a marriage of convenience in order to create the government so that has been perhaps the biggest actually is heel for the pakistan tehreek e insaf and one of the sources of its failures and its inaptitudes so moreover i think one of the main reasons why there is a lot of criticism of the pakistan tehreek e insaf government and generally there is um, you know not much approval and uh, people are disgruntled by this government because this government was uh, dealt a bad hand in the beginning of their term so pakistan was pretty much on the brink of economic disaster and um, institutional imbalances and a couple of other structural problems within pakistan's federal and provincial structures when the pakistan tehreek e insaf got the reins of the country which means that they already had a lot on their plate when they came into power which is why it was increasingly difficult for them to manage all of those affairs and yet also bring the promised reform that that were part of their uh, election manifesto so i think it's important to look at their performance from three angles first of all let's talk about the economic angle the most important pakistan's economy So right so in the beginning uh, when the pakistan tehreek e insaf came into government pakistan had historically high dual deficit which means very high uh, you know current account deficit fiscal deficit extremely high national debt um, very low savings and high inflation and pakistan was on the verge of bankruptcy when the pakistan tehreek e insaf government came into power and then uh, you know in such situation most countries seek um, a package or a bailout uh, package from the international monetary fund which pakistan also sought despite all the many promises that the pti uh, leadership made to the public during their election campaign of never ever going to the imf uh with a bagging ball irrespective of whatever happens but that's exactly what happened and that was also anticipated by most analysts that pakistan has no other option but to you know go to imf uh, for relief but the problem lies that um i think that imran khan and his uh, cabinet was really divided on whether they should pursue uh an imf package or not because essentially they do, did not want to disown their own words of never going to the imf so soon into the government which is why there were a lot of confused uh you know messaging and confused um narrative from the government visa wise the economy and the imf package was concerned which is why um the uh, the pti government kept delaying and um you know handling the arrangement with the imf Uh, which got too late to the extent that the economic pain due to the delay in the IMF package was too much for the consumers and especially for the um, industries and manufacturing uh, sector so in the end they did uh, you know take an IMF package despite the fact that uh, Asad Umar the finance minister of uh, PTI government uh, Imran Khan tried his level best to the utmost extent to somehow uh, redesign the terms and conditions of the imf package by continuously delaying it and not giving it as much importance as needed to be given uh, considering the state of pakistan's economy however he completely failed in that tactic because in the end all of the uh, terms and condition that imf has always implemented and insisted upon pakistan were once again on the plate when asad umar was replaced by one of the um, compliant men uh, among the ranks of the government uh, fees sheikh who was a former official of the imf world bank and basically a man who believes in the imf and the international financial institutions and is part of the neoliberal uh, crusade of uh, united states and uh, international financial institutions which is why uh, immediately after uh, he said became became the advisor to the prime minister on uh, finance the imf package uh, you know was offered to pakistan and agreements were made moreover um, even despite the imf package uh the growth that pakistani economy witnessed after the imf package was really moderate there wasn't much substantial growth that could be seen in the economy and the economy kept uh, you know facing a lot of hurdles 
the tax base for example did not improve as much as the PTI government had hoped or as much as they promised during their election manifesto. So it did increase from 4 million total uh, you know, registered tax entities to 6.2 million but out of the 6.2 million only 40 percent which means 2.5 million people actually uh, filed for uh, you know income tax returns in, in 2020 which means that the efforts to bring up the uh, tax revenue of Pakistan in order to increase the budgetary allocation that the federal government has the fiscal space so to reduce the fiscal deficit have primarily not yielded much results. Thirdly, uh, the much touted and promised reforms in the Federal Bureau of Revenue which is the apex agency for collecting uh, taxes all around the country never really materialized which means that uh, the FBR is still running on the same principles that it has been running in the past which means that there is substantial and outrageous corruption in uh, FBR which the present PTI government couldn't do anything about and most, more specifically I think that friction from within the FBR from the bureaucracy and the uh, officer class of the FBR has been the main reason for why those reforms were never materialized and essentially uh, talking about resistance by the bureaucracy I think that was the major cause of uh, embarrassment for PTI for all of their uh, you know change agendas and reform agendas and new Pakistan initiatives basically falling flat on it on their faces because of resistance and uh, you know refusal to work and collaborate by the bureaucracy this was one of the main hurdles that the Pakistan Tariq and South government faced in the in its initial days because the election manifesto of uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saab was too ambitious and it threatened the established and um, you know parochial interests of bureaucrats in power who did not want to lose their positions of authority and influence by the proposed reforms that the Pakistan Tariq and Saab wanted to instill into the system which is why this party faced more um, you know, resistance and inability to work and bring any change by those very people who are supposed to own and implement the reforms of this new government. So this lack in unity and uh, constant infighting is one of the main reasons why the Pakistan Tariq and Saf has been marred by a poor record of economic performance and bad governance. One important achievement has been uh, you know, made by the Pakistan Tariq and Saf government which was reducing the current account deficit for, from 20 billion dollars to making it a um, uh, current account uh, surplus for a short period and now to having a current account deficit of 3 billion dollars as it stands now. However, we must understand if we dissect it is that the main reason why our current account deficit reduced is not because our exports exponentially increases, increased, it's because our imports exponentially decreased. And this is problematic because majority of our industry and manufacturing sector and a lot of associated uh, sectors are basically reliant upon important technical imports from all around the world which allow them to do their businesses. Now since a lot of tariffs and uh, you know duties have been imposed on um, imports in an effort to reduce the current account deficit and the trade deficit many importers of essential goods of machinery that is essential to their businesses have suffered a lot because now either they have to import those, that machinery and that equipment at very high rates or they have they don't have any option and have to rely on other uh, you know suppliers whose quality of products is not as good as the quality of product that they were getting before which is why the major losers in uh, you know this drop in current account deficit has been industry which is very um, damaging to Pakistan's economy considering that Pakistan was trying to become an industrial economy trying to raise its uh, you know, industrial capital and build upon human resource. Um, but in all of this economic performance which has not been good I think that the coronavirus situation really turned out to be uh, a blessing in disguise for the Pakistan Tariq and Saf government 
even though in the beginning it really shut the Pakistan economy down and brought our growth to the negative range being minus 0.48%, whereas the rest of the world has experienced, especially the developed rich world, has experienced much worse economic impact of the coronavirus and the related lockdowns than Pakistan has. For example, the economy of Britain has lost nearly 20% of their GDP. Japan has lost 13% of their GDP. Um, France has lost 13% of their GDP. The US has lost more than 10% of their GDP. This is unprecedented historic loss in GDP which has never before been experienced by any of these countries, be that the economic crisis of 2008 or even the great world wars. So the impacts, the economic impacts of the coronavirus and the uh, ensuing lockdowns is immense. But that is not the case with Pakistan. I think we have fared fairly better than the Western countries have. And I think in that respect, we have to give some credit to the incumbent government for handling the coronavirus situation much better than even the most advanced economies have. So even though there was substantial criticism of Pakistan Tariq Insaf's approach towards the pandemic and their idea of smart lockdown, which is completely you know, ridiculed and thrown down as uh, nonsensical, actually proved to be very effective because not only did it uh, control the spread of the virus, but it also kept the economy and its essential sectors alive, which was very important for an economy like Pakistan, which is already suffering from very deep economic illnesses. Now that uh, Pakistan's corona situation has improved, uh, a lot of indicators are coming in which suggest that, suggest that Pakistan's economy is booming back. The, uh, the Pakistan Stock Exchange is one of the best performing exchanges in the world right now. International ratings agencies as, such as uh, Moody and um, Fitch have all given a positive outlook for Pakistan's economy and things are generally uh, moving towards improvement, especially because of the uh, very lucrative package that the Pakistan Tariq Insaf government gave to the construction industry. As a result of that, a lot of foreign invest investment from uh, you know, n um, Pakistanis residing in other countries have come into the uh, country, into Pakistan, which has resulted in historically high remittances recorded at nearly um, you know 2.5 billion this month which has never been achieved in in one month before so essentially what i'm saying is that despite the mishandling of the economy in the beginning the pakistan that you seems to have gotten a uh, hand of the economy during and after the coronavirus worst days and now it seems that pakistan economy is moving the upward trajectory primarily because of the very uh, dynamic and active role that the construction industry is playing in Pakistan's economy right now. The second important criteria to judge this government is upon its foreign policy. And I think this is where the government deserves a lot of accolades because of many important initiatives and strategic shift that we have seen in recent years in Pakistan's foreign economy. So for example, the Balakot crisis where India, you know, um, breached Pakistan's sovereign borders, uh, came across the line of control and attacked us, our response was there couldn't have been a better response than the response that Pakistan gave to Indian aggression. And as a result of that, the balance, the strategic balance in South Asia shifted in Pakistan's favor because now the world started to view Pakistan as a responsible, peace-loving state, but also as a powerful um, you know, state which will not accept any aggressions against it. Moreover, Pakistan, the Indian South government was also able to uh, shift uh, international perceptions when it comes to the uh, historic security complex of India and Pakistan and reorient the world's perception of Pakistan from being a hostile and um, rogue state and pariah state to a one more peaceful, um, peace-seeking, responsible, democratic state as compared to India. Now, in this case, some credit uh, should also be given to the Indian leadership, to the Modi and the BJP-led RSS-inspired leadership in order for losing India's good image in the world. But at the same time, Pakistan Tariq Insaf and Imran Khan also deserve some credit for reorienting Pakistan's image in the international arena and improving it substantially. 
secondly uh, one important failure i would think uh, of the pakistan tehreek and saf government has been kashmir so ever since the abrogation of the special status of kashmir by india on 5th of august 2019 the pakistan tehreek and saf government has uh, left no stone unturned in order to you know relay this message to the rest of the world that kashmir is in imminent threat and it is uh, you know could prove to be a flash point for a nuclear war in south asia and indian aggressions and atrocities in kashmir have uh, you know reached the proportions of being crimes against humanity and genocide but despite all of these efforts has anything changed in kashmir no has pakistan prevented india from changing the demography of kashmir no there are already 400000 non kashmiri people who now have kashmiri residency and uh, are you know doing a lot of economic and uh, social and political activities in the valley of kashmir which have long term implications for the demographic makeup of kashmir so essentially we haven't really done anything for kashmir except for you know raising our voice and uh, constantly giving kashmir the lip service that it deserves so that is an important failure i think in foreign policy thirdly um when it comes to sorry thirdly when it comes to our relations with china and the cpac project i think that a lot of lack of confidence was instilled into pakistan and china relations when the incumbent government doubted whether the conditionalities of the cpac were in the best interest of pakistan or not and they wanted to review the entire cpac project now if you ask my opinion i think that was a good idea because certainly what china is giving us is not worth what we are giving it we would probably help china become the next superpower we are the king maker in this equation and what is china giving to us in return is just peanuts and a penny on the dollar we can get a lot more concessions out of china for the cpac route that we are providing it anyhow uh, the pakistan china relationship was strained when they questioned it and subsequently our uh, chief army staff had to go to china in order to convince them of our uh, you know commitment to cpac and to pak china relations and our uh, unwavering support to their uh, initiatives in pakistan fourthly i think our relationship with uh the gulf countries and the oic and the muslim world is an important corner of pakistan's foreign policy and in that respect some progress has been made because pakistan has uh pakistan tehreek e insaf government has to some extent uh, lifted our constant reliance upon saudi arabia for leadership and for direction in the muslim world foreign policy and now we are charting relatively more independent course and trying to fence our borders uh sorry trying to mend our fences with iran which is an important development however recently the foreign minister's uh, negative comments towards saudi arabia did stir a storm in a teacup and once again our chief of army staff who appears to be the guarantor of our foreign relations rather than our foreign minister or our prime minister which are primarily responsible for those things and have the mandate and the uh, you know political mileage to be the representative and guarantor of uh, foreign relations however in pakistan the real power you know naturally rests with the military and the chief army staff is the guarantor for pakistan foreign relations and he was rushed to saudi arabia and once again in order to you know basically sway their concerns and uh, once again please them and uh, allege our uh, you know pledge our allegiance to them once again and on a fifth course i think uh, when it comes to the afghan peace process the current incumbent government has been smarter because it has utilized that opportunity to uh, to the maximum extent and has also mended fences with the united states of america improved relations the imran trump summit was an important uh, you know point a historic point in pak america relations and once again brings a new era of collaboration and economic partnership between at least has a potential of that so some definitely credit goes to the pakistan tehreek e insaf government and finally the most important and the worst um, handled issue of governance in pakistan is perhaps the worst uh, performance track record that the, this government has shown so in the beginning they had a very um, you know 
stern tussle with the bureaucracy where the bureaucracy was very hesitant in, in, to work because uh, they were afraid or rather reluctant to work under the government that constantly talked about uh, accountability of institutions, of bureaucrats, across the board accountability and threatening all of the sectors with punitive action. So the bureaucrats basically tied their own hands and sat on their seats uh, waiting uh, for a more conducive environment to work. And that basically estrangement with the bureaucracy has been one of the, uh, you know, outstanding themes of Pakistan Tariq and Saab government governance track record, which is very poor so far. The sugar scandal case, uh, the weed crisis and the uh, accountability turning into a political witch hunt rather than across the accountability are more important indicators of how this government is clearly failing on the domestic front and does not know what it's doing primarily because it does not have any experience of uh, you know running a country and there is a lot of infighting a difference of opinion within the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government which prevents it from creating uh, a united front and dealing with all of these problems sim uh, you know uh, in a more conducive and efficient manner manner moreover a lot of problems that the current government has faced is because of uh, the business interests and personal interests some of some of its own legislators and cabinet members. So for example, the delay in any action against the sugar mafia is primarily because a lot of sugar mafia is actually sitting in the cabinet of Pakistan the Indian sub government. So um, all in all, I think despite a lot of criticism in media recently and a lot of self praise by the uh, cabinet members of Pakistan the Indian sub the image is uh, uh, the image of performance of the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government in the first two years is really average, and I think that it kind of reflects how our previous governments have also performed, and nothing much has changed uh, in Pakistan in institutional makeup, in uh, you know different uh, areas of the government, and in the balance in civil military relations which at least on the face of it seems like the establishment and the military is with Imran Khan. Now the primary reason for that is that Imran Khan has yielded all the space and the power that the establishment has coerced him to. In return they have promised him support. So it's a hybrid system as the media has uh, rightly pointed out and uh, although there are some improvement much needs to be done. Let's hope that the original um, you know, zeal and passion with which Imran Khan campaigned for his elections and the kind of ideals that he held high actually become state policy. Because if they don't, then the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government has completely failed its own narrative, its own ideology, and does not deserve to win the next election. And if the Pakistan Tariq and Saaf government does not perform and then does not win the next election, we are back to square one and back to the problems that Pakistan has always faced and perhaps we will never be able to get out of that. So let's hope and pray for the best. Thank you for your patience. Allah Hafiz.